Welcome to the Secure CIO, the podcast for technology executives who are tasked with hiring and retaining great cybersecurity leaders. Join best selling author Claire Pales together with industry thought leaders as they answer your questions about sourcing the right leaders, building cybersecurity teams, candidate selection, salaries, skills, and more. Hello, I'm Claire Pales, and welcome to the Secure CIO podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dan Geeson-White. Dan is the Group Executive Digital and Business Technology for Macmillan Shakespeare. Dan joined Macmillan Shakespeare in 2008 and has held a number of senior positions within business systems and IT before being appointed to the role of CIO. Dan is responsible for overseeing all aspects of information technology, information security and program management across the Macmillan Shakespeare Group and for supporting the group of the business by partnering with the company's units on IT and project-related revenue generating programs. Dan has over 20 years experience in IT and 15 years in strategic analysis and program management with a strong track record of leading change in IT and across the business. Prior to joining Macmillan Shakespeare, Dan held senior roles with Suncorp Direct Insurance and AAMI. During this time, he project managed key deliverables in the development and launch of AAMI Business Insurance and bingle.com. Dan, thank you so much for being a guest on my podcast today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Claire. So, Dan, tell us a little bit about Macmillan Shakespeare. How big's the company? What do you do there? And what does the tech function look like? Macmillan Shakespeare is a publicly listed company. We uh, we do diversified financial services, including salary packaging, novated leasing, consumer finance, and asset management primarily run across uh, UK, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, we're about 1,200 to 1,300 people across all those places. And as we're publicly listed, we've got a market cap of about $1.3 billion. The IT space, the tech function, we look after a number of different things, infrastructure, development, test, business analysis, governance, BI, digital, the big part of it really from our perspective is is aligning IT against the business strategy and ensuring that we can execute on that effectively. And so we heard in your bio that information security falls within your remit as well. So is this the first time as a head of tech that you've had security in your remit? And what's you been your experience so far compared to other tech functions that you might look after? How has security been different? It is the first time that I've actually had it within my remit, but I've had it in my remit for a while now. Uh, I think security, in terms of how it differs from the other other areas, there's a broader acceptance of the, the role of most technology areas in the, in the business activity system, whereas security has been behind the covers for quite a long time. It's only really in the last few years started getting a lot more airtime in ex- around exec tables and, and, and at boards and as a result of that uh, it's it's getting a lot more uh, you're getting a lot more opportunity to have a conversation about it but it's also pretty much in its infancy in terms of people's understanding of it and, and how it affects the business and whose responsibility it is. And so within your business how did you start to build the security team and what does it look like now compared to when you, you first sort of took on that responsibility? Originally, we, we really, we didn't build a security team, we built a security capability. So we defined what we needed um, from a security perspective and we created an appetite uh, at, at board and exec level to invest in just some key aspects of security that were beyond what has been the traditional technology-based security uh, work that that we do without talking to anybody about things like firewalls and email protection systems and the like. So we started off with uh, we started off with the things that we thought would be important. We, at the time it was the ASD top four. So we had a look at those. We had a look at ISO uh, and a couple of other standards that were available at that point in time and assessed our particular environment against them, put a business case together and went to both the board, uh, the exec and the board, and had a chat to them about what we needed from an investment perspective and why it was important that we did that. And we took it on as a responsibility within the infrastructure space specifically to be able to build that out now. We've actually got a dedicated security team. There's currently three people in it. 
and they are they are responsible for setting and ex- executing on the security strategy for the organisation. How did you originally source the three staff that you've got and what drove you to, to use the mechanism that you used in order to find the right staff for the level of maturity that your organisation's at from a security perspective? We sourced all three of our staff internally and they've all got different capabilities. Some are, a couple of them are uh, highly technical and, and have got uh, a reasonable background and were involved in our original security setup. Uh, one of them is really about uh, engagement and education. Uh, so she's really got a instructional design and learning and development background. The reason we went internally is these are people that understand our organisation well. They understand the needs of our customers as well as uh, the maturity level of our organisation at large. But uh, the other part of it is it's hard to find security folk out there at this point in time as well. The uh, large organisations are snapping them up and they're doing that relatively relatively quickly as soon as they hit the market. Uh, and therefore, it's 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 either incredibly expensive or really, really difficult to be able to find the right type of people with the right capabilities to come into the organisation. That, that being said, there's also some fantastic people in existing organisations that are really excited about the industry, the, the security side of the industry, and I think giving them the opportunity and the training and the development uh, to be able to deliver this value into the business is, is, is a fantastic thing to be able to do. And you mentioned earlier that you had a security strategy and the team are tasked with delivering that. And has that strategy and that capability you need grown over time as you've sort of built out the team? So it's sort of chicken or the egg. Did did you build out the team and then give them more responsibility or did you find that the capability outgrew the the single person you had originally and and I think now you've got a, a leader in the top as well? How did you sort of manage that capability versus capacity balance? Yeah, we do have a leader in the top now. We've got we've got somebody in the uh, head of, uh, role of head of security. Um, I think the thing about the security aspect is it's evolving. It's not, uh, it, and it's, it changes every day. It's like technology in general, but because the potentially bad actors are always playing in this space, uh, the evolution of security and having a having an understanding of that is is has become even more important. From a security strategy perspective, a lot of that stuff is really about getting the fundamentals right, because that's where that's where people seem to struggle a lot of the time. So ensuring that we get the fundamentals right, and that's not all technical. A lot of that is about education and, and, and keeping our organisation uh, appraised of some of the potential challenges that, that that they may be facing from a security perspective. So I think that um, I think that that you know. The evolution of our security has meant that a greater level of focus is required for two reasons. We've got to make sure that we and and our operation are really clear on what the risks are going forward and we're taking every step that we can to mitigate those risks. And our customers, customers are becoming more aware of those risks and their demands of us in the you know, normal catch-ups or through contractual obligations are getting greater. And what are some of the challenges you've come up against? You mentioned earlier one of the key challenges is that, you know, resources seem to be slipping through your fingers because the, the bigger organisations are able to snap them up. What else have you experienced in your efforts to build the security team, you know, maybe from a budget or a strategy or um, outside of the sourcing part? What else have you experienced that's been challenging? Really uh, awareness and, and, and focus, which leads to things like budget and the like. The awareness of what security is and that it's not an IT issue, it's an organisational issue and ensuring that people understand or are on board with that, uh, understanding their roles in it, you know, the non-technical folk and their role in ensuring that we, we have a good, secure uh, organisation. Uh, there have been some of the challenges that we've had and then when you create the awareness, you're, we're all working in really busy organisations that have got a lot of things on and ensuring that you maintain the focus uh, for a period of time so you can actually build out the, the capability that they, they become the, I think they become uh, some of the key issues that, we, that we've that we come across. And how do customers play a role in driving your security 
need or capability within the business? Have they been quite vocal or, or how have you addressed um, any customer concerns or, or customer driving forces? We're a, a B2B to C company. So our, all of our contracts are with uh, B2B and or the vast majority of them are. So when you go through a tender process, when you are going through a recontracting process, they are actually driving uh, con- the, the security agenda from their perspective um, through contractual requirements. So it's actually helping us focus on those things that are important for our customers, which are generally important for us as well. That's not, there's not a, there doesn't seem to be a fundamental misalignment between what our customers want and, and what we should be doing as an organi- organization anyway. So yeah, that it's definitely, it's definitely coming from the customers and it's definitely become more of a focus of recent times in, in, in this, uh, in our con- contracting process, which I think is, is quite healthy. I mean, our contracts last for, three to five years so you know it just just depends at the renewal point it might have been three years since we did the last one but they also drive audit so we get audited by some of our key customers and uh and so the security audit is is a key part of that and requirements like you know regular penetration testing and the like is is key within those I guess third-party security has moved its way up the the security or audit agenda in terms of third parties sort of right to audit, but also your right to know that others that are exchanging data with you or dealing with you or dealing with your customers are going to protect the information on your behalf. So it's not surprising that, you know, you've had to renew, uh, as you renew contracts, you're really reconsidering the security requirements. Yeah, it is, look, it isn't. It's not surprising at all. And I, the heartening thing from our perspective is really the security requirements that have come across are uh, aligned with a lot of the work that we've done over a period of time. So we haven't had any real gotchas in that process, uh, but it, it, it really did bring to bear the, the uh, amount of focus that security is getting across all industries now and, and, and how important it is not just to the owners of the contract, but their executives and indeed their boards. And Dan, you mentioned when we met that you have been quite proactive around keeping yourself up to date with security, and that includes being a member of ASA, which is our Australian industry body for security. How do you think that's helped you in leading the security team and and what impact has it had, do you think? Probably a couple of things. It helps me stay front of mind for me. So being part of ASA and you get the regular updates and you have the chapter meetings regularly on monthly here in, in, in Melbourne, uh, but you also have the conference on an annual basis. It keeps it front of mind. It's uh, and and that's a that's a really positive thing because you've got there's a lot of things that we need to think about. There's an enormous amount of uh, diversity in IT and 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 you need to be across all of that. And it's it could be quite easy to to forget about a really important aspect like security uh, for short periods of time if you if you don't have something popping into your head that's that's one one aspect of it the other side of it from my perspective really is it keeps me informed of how the landscape is changing it's either, you know you want to avoid making assumptions on whether it's getting better whether it's working whether it's not technology changes really quickly and so do the actors that are out there and you know, everything from fishing exercises to whaling exercises through to how people are doing brute force, through to social engineering, new technologies to be able to support you uh, and also where the, where the trends are going uh, and how you need to edu- educate your staff to try and um, ensure that you don't get pinged by any of these things. That's, it's all information that comes out of ACER and it's all information you can get readily from either their website or... Uh, their regular updates, and I found that incredibly helpful from my perspective, and 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 I try to stay on top of it as much as I can. It also means when I'm talking to the security team, I clearly understand what they're talking about. I think for me, the two things that you just said in there that that I loved were it keeps security front of mind for you, and it's always kind of at the top of your inbox. And the other thing is that you know it it helps you to avoid making assumptions about what's going on with security, and you know I I think. Assumptions are the worst thing that you can do, especially in a in such a fast moving space. As you said earlier, you know, security and technology just are evolving every day. And to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening from an industry perspective, I think is really commendable as a CIO because you're 
you know, every CIO has many plates spinning, but you're making time to keep yourself up to date and not expecting your team to do that for you. So I think it's a, a really great initiative uh, on your behalf. Absolutely. Thanks. Well, I remember what an old boss of mine told me that uh, if it's important to you, it'll be important to your people. So ensuring that it, it is visible that these things are important to you will uh, will help from a cultural perspective to ingrain in people that this is a key part of what we do as, an, as a function within this organisation. And Dan, what would be one piece of advice that you would give to other CIOs who are either currently leading a security team or they plan to be responsible for the security function? What would be one thing you would say to them that would help them on their journey? Be clear on the role, on what the role of security in your organisation is. I think security is not an IT issue. It's got an enormous amount of IT uh, hooks, I will call them, where there are some fundamental technology-related things that you, you need to do, but be really clear on what the responsibility for that security function is and, and get agreement with your peers in terms of what their role is. Our security function do education, they do training, they're responsible for working with the L&D team and ensuring that you know security-related um, courses are included in our, our uh, six-monthly and annual updates. So... I think it's because it's a such an important aspect of how we run businesses nowadays, ensuring that you're very clear on what your role is in that space and, and giving them the right kind of resources and support to be able to deliver on that, that that's absolutely critical. I couldn't agree more. I think defining the scope of what the security team should look after, you know, as you said, that helps everybody. You know, if everybody has a clear understanding of what the security team's there to achieve, as you said, your peers and the other executives can really get on board to understand what what they need to take on um, and and where the gaps are. So it's a really good approach and and excellent advice. Dan, if people want to continue the conversation with you or connect with you, what's the best way to find you? LinkedIn or Twitter or sort of what's your favourite place? Uh, they're welcome to contact me on LinkedIn. I try to avoid social media in the other areas to, so I can't get socially engineered. Uh, <laughs> and they can contact me on LinkedIn anytime they want. Perfect. Okay. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate your advice. Uh, I think your organisation has been on a really great security journey that others will be able to relate to. So thanks for your insights and your advice for our listeners today. My pleasure, Claire. It's been great chatting to you. That's all we have time for today. Thanks so much for listening. For more information on all our guests, check out the show notes at thesecurecio.com where you can also find more information on the Secure CIO framework and sign up for my newsletter. If you loved the show, please subscribe to the podcast and feel free to leave me a five-star rating. I'll see you next week.